Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Nicole Nunu, and I'm here to talk about the money. So, um, um, I'm presenting on market and development for organic squash, tomatoes, and then some peas in southeastern US. Now, this is a, a project that um, was in conjunction with, um, it's a bigger project on which I have a lot of market so, um, the U.S. organic food industry has witnessed a considerable growth over the last decade. Now, this uh, can be attributed to an increased awareness um, to health issues, people wanting to change their lifestyles to eat more healthy and eat more healthy um, options. And millennials like myself, we want to know what's in our food. What are we eating? Is it healthy? Where, where does it go? And we are willing to pay for it. So as I said, millennials are health-centric, and then we are certain generations that are willing to pay a premium for quality products. We want to know where about the food is coming from. Is it sustainable? Is it uh, environmentally friendly? Is it organic? And we, we would prefer to go to a local farmer's market to buy organic food rather than buy conventional food. Now we're talking about organic, organic, organic. What is organic? So organic foods are defined as green products, which means that they are produced in an environmentally friendly manner. They are also known as safer, which means that they are produced with fewer herbicides and then pesticides. And again, they are seen to be more uh, wholesome and nutritious. Now, because of this whole interest in health and lifestyle changes, there's this increased interest in local foods, which has resulted in increased growth of direct um, organic food markets. Now in 2012, the estimated value of um, organic food sales was at $28.4 billion. Now when you look at 2018, the actual sales was about, um, was about uh, $47.9 billion. So which means that there's actually, people are interested in eating organic foods and then the sales of organic foods are, are going up. Now, according to the Organic Trade Association, 7% of these organic food sales occur through farmers markets, food services, and then other marketing channels. Now, the top of um, fresh organic foods and then vegetables purchased within the U.S. consists of um, tomatoes, squash, leafy vegetables, apples, potatoes, bananas. And then most of these products go at a premium price, so they're always a, a, a much um, higher than conventional foods. Because of that, that, uh, that market, or the fact that it is uh, at sort of premium prices, conventional supermarkets and certain uh, mass uh, market merchandises have actually added organic uh, store, uh, shelves in their stores. So you would have them selling conventional and at the same time having the organic shelves as well. So they are creating spaces for these products. So as I said, due to the, the premium, uh, the pre uh, price premium for organic, uh, organic products, this has created a lot of expansion for markets. So people want to buy this. So there's once there's supply, once there's demand, there's going to be that option for the supply as well. So and again, marketing of these foods helps producers to circumvent from middlemen because in agriculture we know that the middlemen are those who make most of the money. But if you're taking organic, you can actually sell directly to your customers and then you circumvent those middlemen from taking away at a chunk of the money. However, this is a very overtiring task in locating available um, market channels for producers. So the objective of this project was to identify alternative marketing opportunities that are available for um, small scale and limited resource organic farmers in the Southeast US. And we looked at three varieties of um, crops, um, the cowpea varieties, um, squash, and then tomatoes. So for our methodology, what we did was to uh, survey um, 40 potential buyers. So they consist of local restaurants, uh, and stores and then entities around Auburn, Montgomery, Tuskegee, and Georgia areas. So we, we had um, people like um, stores like Piggy Piggy, Georgia Farmers Market.
Target, Giant Foods, Atlanta Harvest, and a couple other restaurants who patronize our products. We also sent out uh, bulletins informing most of these um, potential buyers of what we are doing. So we give them uh, the estimated time that we're going to harvest. Even prior to harvesting, we sent out these bulletins just so they know they are informed about what we are doing and when they can have access to these products. We also made phone calls. And then also went to farmers markets as well. And then on campus as well, because we didn't want to just be out there doing the work while our people internally don't get this information. So we did some um, on campus sales as well, and then we made zucchini bread and all that just to inform and educate the campus community. Now, um, these are some pictures from um, like what we did. Um, so over here, we, we involved the community giant gave us a, a space to display our products so the community comes and then we educate them about this is organic and then you know they buy from us directly and then um, this one right here is one of our faculty members he's, he's in charge of the economics aspect of it and he was also uh, educating some uh, campus community about what we are doing and then so for our weekly produce sales these are the five that we had and then we circulated that around now, um, the results. One thing that I realized was that although our buyers were very enthusiastic about buying the products, most of them were not willing to purchase at the organic price. Now, that price differential, it was very, um, I was, I don't know how to say it, but they just didn't want to pay the premium price for it. So they want it, they want the organic, but they don't want to pay the premium price for it. So if the price goes down, you realize that the demand for the products goes up. So this is me smiling broadly after uh, PPP giving me my first check. I was very excited. And over here, it, it, those of you who are farmers know the, the joy you feel when you have your, your produce displayed in a store. Now this is me also over here counting my few dollars at the, at the farmer's market. And again, these are some of the uh, customers that we had. This is a Georgia um, Atlanta Harvest. They are located in Georgia. This is uh, also um, one of our customers, also located in Georgia. They uh, are engaged in the CSA, so people come over to them to buy um, produce on a weekly basis, so we supply it to them. And then again, our uh, produce display on the stores, which is very exciting. Over here, we did on-farm sales. So you come to the farm, and then we weigh the produce for you, and then we pay for it on farm. Some people prefer to do that. They are just passing by, like, hey, I need some tomatoes. Can I come back? Sure, you can come back. You can weigh for them, and then sell it to them. And then, this is a student trying out one of our tomatoes. Raw. And he goes, like, oh, this is, this is really tasty. It's, it's, it's really, really tasty. And that's, that's what we are talking about. So, um, in conclusion, we find out that there's a high potential for limited resource farmers to compete by adopting niche market strategies as one of the ways of breaking into the market. And again, we recommend that um, on farm sales, like what I spoke about, just opening a farm out to people who want to just come onto the farm and then buy, wait, and then sell to them. And then again, selling at retail prices to other farmers who already have um, existing markets. So for the Atlanta Harvest, they are huge in Atlanta. They have huge markets. They supply to vegan stores and all that stuff. So sometimes they are not even able to meet up their demand. So we supply to them, and then they also supply to their customers as well. And then again, research and extension have very key roles to play in assisting limited resource producers to realize their full potential. And that is why we are here today. To, to conduct some of these research and then get the recommendations out there of potential farmers. One thing I noticed was that socioeconomic factors played a very key role in how we were received in Alabama and then in Georgia. Georgia, there was, this, there was the market for people are willing to pay a notch above what Alabama um, uh, consumers wanted to, were willing to pay. And I thought about record keeping. 
and good record keeping in the sense that sometimes as a farmer, if you want to break into the market, you may have to give your produce at a, at a lower price until you are able to get a, a producer, I mean, to get a substantial amount of market. So if you are trying to establish a relationship with a, a consumer and you have to give them the produce for less, you need to record all these things. So that you know whether you're breaking even or not. And again, these are going, these are going to be my personal experiences with the product. Um, I experienced um, certain perceived discrimination, um, probably based on my race or ethnicity or my accent. Because there's some people I tried to call them, and then they would just be like insulting me over the phone. So it just led me to think: What about the um, people, minorities who are in agriculture, who want to even go into agriculture, people who are, and to me, I, feel, I felt that it was a very tough um, market to break into, because just by phone call, you don't know who I am, and I'm even under the umbrella of Tuskegee University. So what if the person is just a lay farmer who wants to establish some kind of relationship with them, and you get this treatment, it's really discouraging to farmers to want to even venture into such businesses. And again, logistics. I cannot count the number of times our car broke down on the road because we are tra transporting from Alabama to to Georgia. I, it's it's a whole lot to deal with as a farmer. I was under I was a student by that time, and I mean, a graduate student. I just want to work and just get paid my stipend, and I had to go through all these things. I had the heart of. Um, a farmer and a marketer at the same time. So it was, I got to understand what farmers go through in getting their products to consumers. And again, difficult, of course, the difficulty of being a farmer and a marketer, multiple hats that farmers must wear in getting a paycheck. Sometimes a farmer, you have to become a motivational speaker just to get your produce out there. Talking to people, I mean, trying to sell your produce to them. So it's really tough for farmers out there. And um, again, very consuming. I get up to go to the farm at 6 a.m. and sometimes I get back at 10 p.m. This is what farmers go through each and every day. Again, um, consumer education. It was difficult breaking through the Alabama market because a lot of them do not understand. I mean, okay, fine, it's organic, but I mean, if I can pay less for conventional, why do I need to buy organic? So a lot of consumer education is key because if the farmers cannot sell their produce, then they, they might as well not go with their making losses all the time just because the consumers are not informed. So um, in, in conclusion, or as I completed this project, I really knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. And so this project geared me towards my PhD program that I'm offering now in Virginia Tech, which is looking at the, the plight of Farmers, it's probably small and limited resource farmers, what they go through, who gives them a voice, who, who, who represents them to say that this is what farmers are going through every day. They are making losses, but they have to just, you know, build it up. So that is what my dissertation is going to be in my uh, PhD at Virginia So um, that brings me to the end of my presentation. And if you need any more information, you can contact myself, Dr. Pongiku, Dr. Moli, and then Dr. Kwaku. And then I'd like to acknowledge UITA and IFA for funding this project. Thank you very much.